Hello and welcome to The Women's Show. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Brack, and I'm joined again by Neil Axon from the Anfield Rap, Philip from Anfield Rap and Liverpool Women's Supporters Club, and the BBC's Emma Sanders. How are we all? Very good indeed, Chris. Good, good, yeah, good. great. Yeah, good, good. We're all happy after a win, aren't we? We're all still smiling, which is good. <laughs> so, so, second show, so, you know, we're a month, about a month into the season now, so I thought we'd, this would be a good time for us just to do a, a bit of a... Where the light, where, where we lie, where we lie in the league and how things are going. So you know, for those who don't know, the we've had four games of the league so far. We uh, lost the opening game to the Lionesses one nil. We beat Watford in a nervy three two in the end. Uh, this uh, nil nil with Bristol, and then first home win of the season, uh, a big two one against Palace, and a really good, really good performance. So Neil, how are you sort of feeling about the opening four games? I think what's what's important for for listeners to to know if they've not been able to keep up with the, the wider picture, and it's all the people who keep me up with the wider picture. I, I need to be honest about that. Is that while seven from those four isn't great, it's only two points off the pace. Everyone's took points off everybody else so far. That's worth sort of pointing out, you know. So Charlton. I've got themselves a game in hand against Lewis, which if they win, they go on to nine points as well. And Sheffield United and Durham are in that position too. And I think that ultimately, this is if this is going to be a drag out sort of season, then that's I, you know I don't know if that's ideal or not for this Liverpool women's side, but it's important that it, you know to to contextualise those results by pointing out that you know Liverpool so far they find themselves in that position. Uh, Bristol, who we were concerned about, haven't come down from the WSL uh, as, a, as a genuine challenger. They've uh, they've only got themselves four points so far, including that draw against Liverpool too. Um, so you know that's worth worth bearing in mind. Um, Watford do look as though everyone will will, will have a riotous time against them at this stage. They've already uh, lost four from four. So I think Liverpool could have done the starting a little stronger, given the nature of the competition that they've been up against. But ultimately, absolutely nothing is in any way, shape, or form undermined by seven points from four games. And as ever in football, it's very much about what they do next. And if they take the two one victory against Palace as a springboard into what will be tough away games against Coventry and against Sheffield. United, uh, Sheffield United, especially Coventry, a little bit less so. Then from there, they've got themselves a, a platform to build on. Cool. So, Philippa, you know, we've, been, we've had three home games now. So, I sort of feel like as the season's gone on, and it's only four games out, the home games, the performances have improved. And I think we've been a bit more lively in them. Uh, to be fair, the away performance against Watford, for those who didn't see it, Liverpool battered Watford for the first, first half and probably should have been more than three goals ahead. And it just a little bit of um, sloppiness in the last probably 15, 20 minutes made it a bit closer than it, closer than it has been. But what do you think about the home form so far? Um, I mean, it was obviously really disappointing in the first game against London City Lionesses that we, we lost that game 1-0. Um, I actually felt really disheartened after it because I, I felt we really needed to get off to a good start. Um, and it's a game that, for me, we should have been winning. Um but I think they've had a strong start to the season as well. So again, it kind of brings things into a little bit more perspective. I think when once you get to see where teams are kind of ending up in the table um, at this point, I know it's still only early days, but when you've only got 22 games, I think you can already start to see kind of where teams may well roughly end up sort of thing. Um, but then the Bristol City game, um, I thought we performed a lot better in that game, to be honest. It looked like the, the team was a lot fitter. Um, you know, and I know they had issues in pre-season with COVID and et cetera. So I think, you know, just that extra bit of time together, um, you know, it's a fairly new new side with all the new signings as well. I think that really helped. Um, and, we, you know, in that game, we actually went down to 10, 10 players. Um, and I think that that, you know, we showed quite a lot of grit and fight in that game. And when we were down to the 10, to me, we were the better side. We were the stronger side. We were the one that looked like more like we were going to score. Um, and then, you know, Lewis ended up going down to 10 as well. And it just ends ends up with both teams, I think, maybe deciding that it's better not to lose it than to win it. Um, and then the, the Palace game at the weekend, for me, I thought was probably our best performance of the season. Um, you know, we... There was no point, I don't think, where I felt we, we were in danger in that game of, of losing. Um, and I think that's important. Um, you know, we'll go on to talk about officiating later on. Um, that, that for me, was the, the only sticking point was whether or not the, the referee was going to make some sort of mad call that would then end up uh, mm. costing us. But, uh, 
yeah, the uh, the performance for me was the best one out of out of the three that we've seen, and you know we got the win that we thought we deserved. Yeah, I can't lie. Uh, anyone who sat next to me, especially my eight-year-old daughter, uh, I was not calm for the last ten minutes. I was <laughs> up and down, f bombing and all sorts. I had an eight-year-old calm me down because I couldn't I couldn't cope anymore with it being still two-one. But when, once the game's over, and you got a bit of hindsight thing, and you know, they, to be fair, they they cope with Palace pretty comfortably in the end. Uh, yeah. But the big thing, Emma, probably in the Palace game was, which we probably haven't haven't been able to do in previous seasons, a bit of. Flexibility in the formation, you know, going 3-4-3. Three, three. I can't remember last time Liverpool played a back three. Uh, he seemed to bring out the best in, um, you know, Liam Robe. I mean, Jazz Matthews had a really good start to the season and it's a good way of bringing Michaela Moore. It sort of hit the fact that we didn't have uh, such a big personality and good player in Nifahi. Yeah, massively. And actually, when you look at the squad that we've probably had over like the last, I don't know, I guess two years or so, yeah, we brought in new new players and such, but... We've had strong centre backs, and we've had a lot of sort of defense, defensive minded midfielders or versatile players who can play in back four positions as well as in midfield. So it kind of made sense to obviously play three at the back, but five it was it was five at the back out of possession. Um, so it kind of made sense to do that when you've got kind of so many defensive minded players in the squad. It meant that we, you know, you could have Leanne Rove, who I think has been in good form so far this season, back on the pitch. And then you've got the likes of, you know, Razza Roberts, who you can bring on off the bench in terms of slotting into any kind of midfield role. And obviously Michaela Moore, who was a player that came in last season, who's got the ability to play as a centre-back and a defensive mid. So there's there's options there. And I think it's an interesting one going forward. And one thing that we haven't really seen from either Vicky or Amber in the Championship was was too much experiment at the back. We've seen different formations going forward, but not really at the back. And actually in the championship, you come across so many different challenges from from teams going forward because there's such a range of, well, one, professionalism within the league, but also such a range of the types of teams that you'll play because some teams will play on 3G pitches and therefore, um, you know, might have the ball in the air a lot more. It might be a bit more long ball. So, you know, you're less likely going to play with a high line, which you often get with a back three, for example. So there's all sorts of these different challenges. So I was really excited to see that. And I thought it worked really well. I thought it was our best performance. And I agree with Philippa. At no point did I think we were going to throw away the, the lead, even when we went 2-1 down, because it was just an absolute fluke goal from Palace. Yep. We never really offered anything. Um, a real threat, I don't think. Um, they put a couple of balls into the box, there was a couple of individual errors, but nothing major, which you're going to get in a game of football. Um, so, yeah, I thought, I thought it was good. I thought it was pleasing. And it's good to know that that's an option in terms of a defensive setup going forward. Yeah, I mean, the other pleasing thing from the Palace point of view, I'll come back to you on this, Neil, is uh, some of the tactical maturity of the team. Uh, because, you know, Missy Bow and uh, Kerry Holland, they're very attack-minded midfielders, you know, and that's what they're there for. They're, they're there to get forward and getting goals, but they had to play as a two and be really tactically disciplined to almost play a midfield role, not the attacking role, which is, you know, again, a sign of maturity and the cleverness that the side's showing. I think that that was, I thought that what was different and it it, it stuck with me actually post-match in comparison to the, the previous home games was I just felt like the everyone knew the jobs in the 5-2-3. Yeah. Everyone knew the jobs. There was real clarity of this is what I've got to do and this is what gets us through the next few minutes um, in all phases, really. The length of time between the, the fortunate goal when it goes 1-1 and when Liverpool make it 2-1 is four or five minutes. And it's four or five minutes where Liverpool making it 2-1 is coming. Now, there's maybe a bit of a conversation here about Liverpool maybe keeping that intensity up to the break and making it 3-1 and ensuring that you're not swearing woefully in front of your <laughs> eight-year-old daughter, Chris. <laughs> but in general, you know, there was... Ultimately, Crystal Palace looked... By the time you get to about 60 minutes... Millie Farrow's gone off, who I thought was really bright for them, uh, for Crystal Palace and, uh, as a number nine. I thought she was really, really bright. She's gone off, and it's really difficult to sort of work out where the goal's going to come from. And those two in midfield are a really good example of it. The, the, the pair of them knew what the jobs had to be, how they had to win the battles, and then what they could do is, as Liverpool moved up the pitch and went through the gears. They knew when to support, and they knew that the pair of them were constantly integral. Prior to this point, there's been a lot of 4-1-4-1 in, in all sorts of phases of football. I I think if you play 4 one 4-1 and it doesn't work perfectly, it works very, very badly because the second four, no one knows quite what to do. 
Are the wingers meant to be supporting the forwards? Are they meant to be covering the fullback? Are the two midfielders attacking midfielders? Or are they holding midfielders? Are the midfielders who need to sit close to the defensive midfield one to help out there? Or are they there to go and join the attack? The fact of the matter is the three in attack, you know, Hodson gets the goal. She's up there in attack. And without Liverpool having the, a sort of a genuine, pure number nine option, the three attackers knew that they needed to attack. The, the, the two fullbacks knew when they needed to support. And then the two in the middle of the park knew when they needed to go and support in those wide areas as well. And it allowed the back three to be able to step out. You know, I thought that like Leanne Robe over the course of the 90 minutes was excellent in terms of knowing when to go, when not to go, in terms of beating a direct opponent um, and just having a real sense of assurance. And there's only really the excellent, and we do need to be clear, the excellent double save when um, when effectively we got ourselves into a little bit of trouble with Taylor Hines that Rachel Laws makes where she's really brave and really bold, where Crystal Palace, even including the goal in a strange way, really managed to, to, to hurt Liverpool. So, you know, I think that tactically it suited everyone. And I think that that clarity is something which... Matt Beard can build something around. I'm not saying that Liverpool will have to play 5-2-3 or 3-4-3 in every single game, but I think everyone knowing precisely what's expected of them is, is, is a minimum requirement. And I think that if that's the case from a Liverpool point of view, it will take a good side to beat them because, you know, Leanne, Leanne Robe's a really good example of this. She's better as a footballer than the vast majority of footballers in this division. And if you give her the opportunity and the framework to show that, even from the heart of the defence, she'll show it with regularity. Yeah, because we saw... Uh coming out, bringing the ball out, which you know we haven't seen her do for a while, yeah. more in a back four. I do think the fact she's played left-back and right-back quite a lot for Liverpool as well probably helps that, because she's quite quite used to it. But um, going on to sort of like, you know, we, we had a lot of incomings this summer, so, you know, any sort, you know, who's, how have we sort of made of the incomings? I know it, it, look, it's it's four games in, so they've still got time to, to settle. I mean, Jazz Matthews, to me, is like she never left. You know, she's just been fantastic, I think, as a signing. Anyone. Yeah, I, I I agree with you there, Chris. Um, you know, she's very assured on the ball. Um, you know, she's not not the most vocal, I would say, at the back, but mm. she she kind of like leads by example. Um, you know, she's she's very assured on the ball. I, I've been really impressed with um, how she plays the ball out from the back as well. And I think, you know, where was just making the point there about having like the back three. I think that really suited all of those players because they're all quite comfortable on the ball. So they're not they know that if if they try and take the ball out of defense and you know somehow they get it wrong, they know that they've got another two there that's going to help them get them out of a tricky spot. And I think that's really important. Um so Yaz Matthews definitely for me is the one that stood out. Um but I've also been really impressed with uh, Rihanna Dean. Um I know we didn't get to see her yep. at the weekend, but I think you know she's a proper centre forward. It's something that I feel like we've kind of like missed a little bit. Uh, very intelligent. Um you know, it's just a shame that she was injured at the weekend. Hopefully we see her again now in the next few games um, because I think that's something that this this side kind of need because uh, that is the one criticism I'd have of them at the weekend was that we didn't turn that second goal into a third and a fourth goal uh, when ideally that's what we all want so that we're not yeah. swearing at our yeah. eight-year-old daughter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I could, that's got to be the gift for, that, isn't it, for the whole show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, that's how stressed um, so. I am. How much am I swearing? That's how you know how stressed <laughs> I am. Uh, I mean, uh, for people who haven't seen Rihanna Dean, uh, go on the FA Player website or go on YouTube, have a look at her goals against um, uh, Watford. It's Watford, yeah. Because you know, she's, yeah, she's a tall physical striker, which you think she's a target person. But my God, the goals she scores, I think it's the second one, where she roofs it top corner. That was the most encouraging. I think, you know, we've not had that as an option for quite some time. So again, that's what made the Palace result so much more impressive because we didn't have that, you would say, the biggest focal point. Um, what have you thought, Emma, of, uh, I think Charlotte Wardlow, she's probably echoes how little have done she? She's just grown into the season as she's gone on. You know, still very young, but I think she's grown yeah. into it. Yeah, a very young fullback. I think I'd be lying if I said I wasn't very surprised um, when her name was, was on the team sheet for the first time ahead of Raza Roberts, who's obviously an experienced Welsh international who we've got used to seeing at right back for Liverpool for a while now. Um, and I still think Roberts um, can be a really effective player in midfield. I do like her in midfield. Um, but yeah, she's she's really grown into it. Um, she's still, um, I think, to be overly critical, um, probably a little bit sloppy in possession at times. But um, no, on, on the whole, I think she's, you know, she's tactically assured. Um, she's got a good engine. 
Um, she seems to work well, work well with the experienced players either side of her. You know, the likes of Jazz Matthews, who's who, like Philip has said, completely agree, who's come in and sort of leads by example on the pitch. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see how how much she grows, and it's good that we've got competition in that that position now because I don't really think we've had too much competition um, too much competition in that position. I mean, badly and Robe sort of be there as a backup to Taylor Hines, obviously. That isn't her natural position. She can play in full backs. I think she's better as a centre back. But Taylor Hines has at least you know, been aware of that. I don't think we've had as much competition on the right hand side. So, yeah, really, really good, um, promising start from her. Yeah, and then probably the other incomes we've had really is only a handful now. It's probably it's only Leanne Kiernan who has played yeah. quite a lot of football for us, and <laughs> Carla Humphreys has come on as an impact. So the rest of the signings we haven't actually really seen I, it, to be honest. Yeah, Chris, I I, I think that. Leanne Kernan is, she's going to be constantly busy and she wants to be involved in games. Liverpool, I think, can have a nice little balance amongst that front three where I think that's someone like, you know, you've got um, you've got Leanne there. I think Rihanna Dean, I think if Liverpool can get her a run of games, the idea of, of Leanne buzzing around her, uh, if if Rihanna's causing a bit of chaos, if Kernan can be buzzing around Dean a little bit, then that offers something. And then if there's a ball carrier in the other slot, I thought Mel Lowley played really well at the weekend as an example of it. So someone direct in the other slot. That's a nice little balance between the three of them. And then there's, there's alternatives to move around. I think Kernan's ultimately going to want to net at some point soon and then I think that there might be sort of greater relaxation she had a couple of slightly of, of shots from distance that were understandable and that they were almost there to be hit but there were other options against Palace I felt when she when she had the ball where she had it uh, I think you know she's the sort of footballer I think if she could get herself a couple under a belt and then she can relax into playing I think Carla Humphreys to me hum, Humphrey sorry to me looks like a really useful footballer for Liverpool. She looks like she's got really strong way to pass. And I think that this back three can sort of probably allow, if he sort of continues with it, a number of options for the manager. He can go a back sort of, he can go wing backs, two in midfield, a floating attack in midfield, a type. Uh, and he's got good alternatives there with Carla and with Rachel Furness. And then he can have a front two, which can be Kernan and Dean, or maybe one other and Dean in there as well. Uh, or he can have it with the, the players working in wide areas and a three strung out across the pitch. And then he can shake that up a tiny little bit as well. Uh, there's a couple who can drop back into that midfield role in different ways. And, you know, I think that there's, there's genuine, I think, opportunity uh, f for Liverpool to to get to be able to solve the problems on the pitch uh, a tiny little bit, to be able to solve them from the bench if they're coming up against something, and to be able to throw players forward a tiny bit more, even though you know playing five defenders does sound a little bit more conservative. It needn't, and I think that I think Kernan can be a, can be a really useful part of that because I, I, mm -hmm. I don't I don't think, and I think you got to see during the game against Crystal Palace with the amount of fluidity there was between the front three, I think that that's a positive. But I think the flip side is that it allows, if if Dean can get in, get settled, and produce the sort of performances she does against Watford on a regular basis, then there's lots of room for other players to prosper in the space that she'll create. And, and Kernan can be one of them. But, you know, Humphrey can be one as well. Furness can be one as well. Mel Lawley can be one as well. And I think that that's what, what can drive Liverpool on and turn one goal, mark winning margins into twos, threes, and fours a little bit if they can keep the momentum and the positivity going. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally agree. And then, so of the other incomings, we haven't really seen any of them. Unfortunately, um, Megan Campbell got injured in uh, pre-season. I did see uh -huh. her Instagram. Uh, she took a picture of her actually wearing a pair of boots, so that's a, a positive side. Um, the little I know of her, and this is where Philippa educates me, which is on a regular occurrence. Um, she's obviously a defensive player, but uh, she has obviously also had the weapon of a, of a long throw, which is just something a bit different, which again plays into the Rihanna Dean mode of it's just a, it's, a, it's a plan B it's a different option and it gives Taylor Hines uh, an option to get rested every now and again because that was probably a problem last year so I think she was ran into the ground a little bit and then the other one we know is Yana Daniels who sadly picked up an injury so we've only seen her against Bristol for about 20 minutes but we've had Yana before you know I mean she's very direct Belgian international um, which is probably again the only other sort of really direct runner we have is, is probably Mel Lawley so again it's just a another option, I suppose, when she's available. Yeah, if I'm being perfectly honest, I, I, I do think she is more of a, a, a squad player um, there to kind of, um, you know, provide a bit of backup, provide a bit of experience within the squad, um, a little bit of know-how. Um, obviously, she's worked with, with Matt Beard before, so she can help be one of those players behind the scene to kind of um, drive the message and the vision, etc. So, um, 
yeah, I, I think I think she'll have a key role to play sort of within the training rooms. Um, I I don't think she'll get as much game time as, as some of the other new signings. Um, but who knows? Um, you know, there's like you know, like Neil said, there's loads of opportunities there in terms of competition within the squad. So yeah, she's she's certainly another option. I thought you got to see a little bit from Georgia Walters as well yeah, uh, yeah. in terms of the, that sort of closing it out, little bits and pieces that Emma's referring to. I, I suspect she may well fall into the same category the way in which Emma's just described Jana. But the, again, thinking of both alternate alternatives and options, I thought she she showed a, a busyness, a bustle, and just sort of helped Liverpool get out and get up the pitch in the last five minutes against Palace. And I think that that's, you know, certainly whilst, whilst the substitution situation is the way in which it is, then I think that having the idea of someone who's just going to be a good sort of closer for Liverpool, who knows who knows how to go and win a couple of throw-ins, who knows how to just sort of to alleviate that pressure. I think that she could have be able to offer sort of genuine quality there. And, and again, the way in which we're describing it, if we can get Rihanna Dean fit and firing and playing really well, the idea of having another bustling option uh, along along with Kern and to sort of play off her, I think is no bad thing for Liverpool. And again, the other player that we're, we're, we're sort of we're not really referring to whilst we're talking about new signings is also Rachel Furness, who can who can offer a lot of that as well. Um, and I think that that's, I think all of this means Liverpool, you know, there's no game where they shouldn't be going into it, feeling like they've got the genuine options to make sure that they pick up all the points and I'd extend that to being able to progress within the within the within the Conti Cup as well. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. So we'll come on to the upcoming fixtures shortly, but um, I think this is a bit of a subject, uh, I think definitely for me and Neil at the Clippers, and I think it's, but it's definitely been a subject uh, me and Philip have definitely had and the people I sit with probably now for the five years I've been going to the women's game is officiating uh, or the lack of standard in officiating because I, you know, coming from obviously watching the men's game until five years ago, really getting into the women's team and enjoying it, I find the standard of officiating at all levels of women's football quite bafflingly poor. I, I've watched the WSL games and some of the decisions I'm just going, you know, this is this is elite women's football, this is international footballers, and we're not getting elite level officiating. Um, and it, it just feels like it takes away from the game and it also it, it it makes the game sometimes in my opinion look a bit amateurish, which it isn't. But I understand people have to have their opportunity to become an official and they have to they have to gain their experience. But I don't see why you have to gain your experience at the top level of women's football. Shouldn't you be gaining your experience at the lower levels? And that's how you work your way up. That's how things work, isn't it? But, um, Philippa, what's your officiating take? Yeah, I mean, I mean, against Palace, it was just absolutely dreadful, wasn't it? There was just decisions that were being made that you were just wondering where they were coming from. Um, you know, clear yellow card offences just weren't being penalised. Um and it's it's a regular occurrence. Uh, you know, I'm not going to single out anybody in particular. Uh, but you know, my my issue here is with the FA. Uh, you know, if they're serious about women's football and you know they want to drive it onto a level that that it is this elite game that they seem to want it to be, then they need to make sure that the officiating you know complements that. And at the moment, it really doesn't. It's it seems to be that you've got your Premier League officials, you've got your Championship officials. You've then got the rest of the men's game and then the women's game gets what's left. And that to me just isn't good enough if you're serious about, you know, wanting it to be the best women's league in, in the world, which is, you know, what they seem to be suggesting. And yet they don't back it up with, you know, the people that they get to to be in charge with the whistle. Um, you know, we talk about goal line technology, uh, but for how often that gets used, I would spend the money on, you know, investing in professional um, referees across the board in both the WSL and in the championship, because I think that's something that's coming in the WSL. Um, and I would I would invest heavily in it because, you know, these these people aren't making these decisions deliberately. You know, they're not, you know, they're not getting things wrong deliberately and and trying to influence games in the wrong way. But they need to be given the right tools to be able to do it to the to the level that they want to and what we want them to. And at the yeah, moment, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, it feels like a lack of experience. But uh, I'm, I mean, I must admit, when someone got a free kick for falling over in the last five minutes, I must admit, I, my head nearly popped off. I've got to be, I've got to be honest. Uh, but but I think on that, Chris. I mean, for me, if there's if my sort of off off the last eighteen months of watching it. I'll be really honest and say I think one of the issues I see is a general vibe towards just far, far too much leniency. 
So I take your general point around the, 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 you know, when someone got a bit of a soft one late in the game, there aren't actually that many, I don't think, really soft free kicks. What there isn't is enough safeguarding of the players. For my yeah. liking, there's a lot of stuff that goes unpunished for reasons that doesn't make much sense to me unless there's this desire to want to be able to say that these are really competitive games and everyone gives, you know, everyone gives 100% in a, in a, in a sort of semi patronized way, which, by the way, I've, I've done at times when people have asked me what it's like to go and watch the women's game. I'll say everyone gets stuck in because they do. But part of the reason why everyone gets stuck in is because it takes a lot to get a yellow card in a women's game. Hmm. It really yeah. feels to me like it takes a hell of a lot to get a yellow card. There was one. Um, I think it was on either it was on Holland or Cairns in the first twenty minutes uh, in that game at the weekend. The throw in the middle of the pitch, they're running directly at the Palace defence. They're still about 40, 50 yards from goal. Don't get me wrong, but they just get cleared out from behind. Absolutely yeah. cleared out from behind. There's no attempt to win the ball, and ultimately Liverpool probably I think had a four on four or a five on four from a Liverpool point of view with the ball carrier, and will have fancied they were in a goal scoring position. Now, if that's just immediately punished, automatic yellow, don't you know in all levels, all professional levels of men's football. That's a not even look at the referee. You're getting a yellow, yellow. You just know you're getting a yellow. You're taking that's, a that, yellow that, for that, the that's team. A, that's the taking one for the team. Uh, the, one yeah. that got me, the one that got me was um, Leanne Robe in the first half. Uh, she gets cleaned out. It's a high tackle, high yeah. up on the chin. And as soon as I saw that and she went free kick, I went, right, okay. And she walked away. I was, I went, yeah. in any other and, game of football I've watched, that's a yellow and you're going, oh, I've seen, I've seen them go for worse. No, I... And, and, and I think that that's something which I would say is the common thread between most of the bad, bad referee and performances that I've seen. The, the common thread is far too much leniency. You don't see that many yellow cards. You very, very, very rarely see a red. I mean, it's ironic because in Liverpool versus Bristol, there are two. And that's why, you know, you can always you can always tie yourself up in knots. But it's very, very rare you see a red. And for me, it is far too much on the side of leniency and not enough of protecting the players. Now, there's also a little bit of perhaps bias in amongst this in that I feel as though the more you're protecting the players, you're protecting the better players. And I generally feel that Liverpool have the better players, if you see what I mean. But for me, there's just not enough protection. And it feels as though a levels of physicality are allowed to creep into certain matches off the basis of some notion of evening it up or not wanting it to be seen as though you're being too protective towards the players, maybe in a gendered way. I don't know. But it's for me, that is the concern. And that's what I'm seeing game by game, much more than individual free kicks being the wrong decision at times. I think that is there, but there's too much that's let let go. That's not given a free kick for. And then stuff that's given a free kick for, there's too much of cards not being produced. And it wouldn't take much to start producing some cards across the league to ensure that that would then whittle down fewer fewer questionable tackles and then fewer sort of questionable free kick or non-free kick decisions, I think. Yeah, I think... So, so I see Neil's point. Yeah, I mean, you don't. But again, it goes back to is that the experience thing? But from your point of view, Emma, you know how how are the how does the management side or how do the uh, see see this efficient? Do, do you see it as a problem or do we see it so they can use to their advantage? i I mean, it's a good question. Um, I think it's a really complicated complicated issue within the women's game, and I think there's a lot of elements to it. I think you've got one the professionalism of the game has absolutely outraced the, the amateurism of the officiating. We, I remember having a, a sit-down roundtable with the um, the FA and officials towards the end of last season. I think it, it might have even been in the summer. Um, and we were basically, you know, in terms of the media, had kind of lost our rag a little bit and had basically a dis- discussion with them on, on why amateur referees weren't becoming professional, why money wasn't being invested by the FA. And um, what really surprised me was um, we were told that actually a lot of these officials don't want to become full-time. So that raised alarm bells to me because I thought, well, why do they not want to to become full-time? Is that because it's not a lucrative offer in terms of are they they not getting paid enough to make a living? Because that's a, you know, if if you're going to be a full-time referee and you're, giving up your weekends to officiate and you're doing your licenses, then surely that's because you have a long-term ambition to become official with an official within the game. So I think that's one thing that needs addressing. Two, there hasn't been enough um, referees come through the women's football pathway as opposed to the men's football pathway. And we know it is a different game. And I think this is where the, the safeguarding element comes into it because the way that women's football is played is, is just naturally different. So there are going to, obviously going to be different challenges. Um, that come with that so I think that's one element and then I think there's a third element of um, there's been a lot of focus obviously on 
broadcast and kind of licensing and just the general structure of the women's game that again I think officiating has been left behind so there's a lot of elements to it and I think now that you have kind of ticked a lot of the other boxes it is very much and rightly so in the forefront of this needs addressing extremely soon and I think the more that people like ourselves talk about it and other people talk about it it's an issue that the FA will will look at but you know I've spoken to a couple of people within the game off record and um, I know that for example they brought in fourth officials in the championship I think just from this season and um, I'm, I'm yet to see kind of the benefit of, of really what they're giving to the game um, so instead of bringing in fourth officials that are essentially just a fourth person that's doing the exact kind of amateur role that was already in place why not invest that money or resource or training whatever in the existing pool of officials and getting them to an elite level first and then going from there um so there's there's question marks i mean certainly when you when you talk to teams perhaps that haven't got the same quality of players like liverpool they know that there's always a chance to get back into games they look to exploit those things you know they might not play dirty as such but um you know they know that they can get away with yeah 50 50 challenges um so whereas you know if you've got a player that is on a yellow card which is extremely rare as neil says um if there's if there's an opportunity there to win a 50 50 if you were on a yellow in the men's game you might think twice about it you're not going to think twice about it in the women's game i don't think in my however many years of reporting on women's football have i seen more than two red cards and i think both of them have actually been at national level i don't think i've ever seen that I'm sure there will have been during my time, but as in, I don't think I've witnessed one live. Um, a straight red, do you mean, Emma? Um, yeah, certainly a straight red. Um, maybe just a red altogether, aside from, uh, uh, yeah, like I say, aside from national levels. I'm trying to think of one that I've seen in, in, a, in a league game. And the fact that I can't pluck mm. one out, I think, says it all. But yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed. And yeah. um, it's... Good. Yeah, certainly from like within the game, it's absolutely their their number one priority that management want to want to be dealt with. Yeah, because almost I think the five years I've been watching women's football, I think I've seen more bad injuries on the pitch in a women's mm. game than I have in any men's game. Absolutely, you know, yeah. and and some of them are just over the top ball. You know, typical, you know, a tackle over the ball. You know, which we all know you you, you dice with a red card there. You're lucky if you get a free kick. And that's yeah. that's where that's where it's coming from. So, you know, it's it's not. And luckily, we can say it's after a win, so it doesn't it doesn't look as it doesn't like you being bitter when you're saying it. But it's across all games. You know, I've 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 watched you know some of the WSL stuff this year. You know, great games, but you know, there there has been tackles and as Neil says, instance where you just go and like, I, I, I don't believe they let I can't believe they let that go. But you know, we are where we are. Mm-hmm. So moving away from official, let's talk about something positive. So. We do this feature uh, all the time now on the women's show. It is I'm going to pick three players I want to talk through because uh, only because um, I think it's wrong for me to assume that everyone knows who all the women's players are. I, I I'm getting to know them a, a, a lot better. Uh, you know, Philip and Emma educate me all the time about them, so I know I know a lot more, which is a, a good thing. Uh, so the first person that I want to talk about now, this will work how we get this to work now, is going to be. As Neil already pointed out, the key, the key person in the first half, Rachel Laws, who uh, rejoined the club uh, last summer, uh, very experienced keeper. Was for those who don't know, she was she was our goalkeeper uh, when we won uh, last won the league. Uh, she was on loan from Sunderland, Sunderland at the time, uh, but she's just vastly experienced, uh, really good communicator, keeps people on their toes, but an excellent goalkeeper. Uh, which, to be honest, has been an area that we've probably had a, a bit of concern around for the last two or three years. What's your opinion, Neil? I think she looks excellent. I think that you got to see, you know, the showcase of the double save. But I think that she very much is a full penalty box goalkeeper, which I think is 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 very very good for Liverpool, and especially if they want to play as high a line as they did uh, the other day against Palace, which they should want to do, in that, as far as I'm concerned, as much as possible. I think she's also quite clearly a terrific communicator. We got to hear a lot of that last season when there was no one in the ground. Uh, but I think that she's she, she, she's good. In terms of keeping people honest and keeping them aware, I also think the distribution's good and should be at times better respected by her teammates. I thought there was a couple of times last game uh, where, for both the back three um, and for Laws, um, 
there was there was times where people just need to be a bit more on their toes. They were going to get the ball passed into passed into a sprinting position. You know, they were going to get a, a, a pass with information on it that was going to send them a couple of yards further forward. And in the end, some of it just sort of went dead to touch because people were on the heels a tiny bit. I thought that that was a minor problem with Moore at the right hand side of centre half position, uh, and it was also a problem spraying the ball out to both fullbacks at different times. And I think that Laws wants to be progressive. To me, she looks the absolute epitome of the sort of football that Liverpool should want to be part of taking them back into the WSL in that she also still looks utterly determined to improve and to be part of a really progressive football outfit I, I think she's I think she's an excellent player I really do I think Liverpool are fortunate to have her uh, to be quite honest with you and I think that as I say I think she can be a massive part of, of what this side does that's successful this year but we've got to play to her strengths, capitalise on her strengths, and everyone's got to be aware that, you know, if you're going to get a ball from Rachel Laws, it's not going to be a soft one. It's going to be absolutely pinged into you, and she's going to, you're going to be where she wants you to be. And I think that if Liverpool can continue to sort of work on that, it gets you three, four, five yards further up the pitch as a starting position. And then from there, everything can be more progressive. You know, this isn't just the idea that she's a very good shot stopper, which she is. She's good coming for crosses. You know, I'd be, I'd be surprised. We obviously haven't seen everyone yet turn up to Prenton Park or seen everyone play Liverpool over the course of the season but I genuinely would be surprised if there was a better goalkeeper in the division than Rachel Laws and I feel as though there probably there won't be more than five or six who are in a class even the division above Liverpool have got a you know, be be grateful that they've got her. I think Riley Foster's a good good player as well. I hasten to add. I think Liverpool mm. have got the two of them there, and they, they should be really pleased with that. But the way you keep them both and keep them both happy is by succeeding. And succeeding in this instance is is, is Rachel back playing WSL football, and then Riley able to play the cup competitions this season and next season. And Liverpool go seriously into those cup competitions with a plan to go deep into them. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And uh, Emma, we were talking about it uh, after the Palace game. Um, the one thing she does, which is we all call it the dark arts. She's great at falling on a ball, delaying it. Little things that are, they're all little things, but the things that you just need to get a result of the line. And I do think that brings a bit of a calmness around the defence of the team is we'll see a game out and I will show you how to see a game out, which I do think is something we've sometimes missed a little bit with, um, you know, not disparaging too many keys out in the past, but I just think she's a cut above what we've had probably the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that comes from the experience. You know, she's been around for a while. She's got bags of WSL experience. And actually, I remember um, when Liverpool were looking to bring her in and um, sort of, yeah, I remember kind of the general chit chat in the transfer window. And obviously, you know, you pick up on things as, as a journalist and I'd kind of caught wind of the move and um, remember like sort of getting the the phone call the message or whatever it was and thinking surely this isn't right like she could be going to any WSL club and at the time it was obviously because Reading Reading had become the first WSL team to um to be furloughed and if that obviously played into it um I think she didn't renew the contract I don't know whether that was her decision or the clubs whatever it may be um the situation arose and you know she was looking for a new club and I just thought surely she'll be going to you know to a WSL club so um, yeah, I, I I think she's a fantastic keeper, and it is that experience that that she yeah that I think gives her that kind of extra bite and um, aggression to her game. The fact that she is she is from the northeast, she isn't afraid to um, <laughs> you know to uh, yeah to do the dirty work. But Make I think she just has yeah. <laughs> um, but I think I think she just has the confidence as well, and I think that's that's the other thing is that she, you know she'll she'll take. A yellow card if that ever arises ever um but yeah she, she, <laughs> <laughs> she will take it for time wasting um because she'd have, hold, she'd have to hold the ball for half an hour for that to happen <laughs> yeah um, yeah because she yeah she's just got the confidence to do it um she's been around she knows how things work so um i i think she i think her and riley actually are the best two goalkeepers in the championship um certainly within the best four easily um and yeah and I, I think um, I think Rachel has done enough to cement her place as, as Liverpool's number one, but she's got good competition there as well. Yeah, it's nice in that position where, you know, the one game, a couple of games Rachel wasn't available for, Riley Foster was there and he, he, he kind of shrugged going, oh, OK. It, and that's that's testament to how good Riley is. You, you don't really worry too much um, when she's in. And again, she's probably learning off. Rachel is probably an ideal person to learn off and to develop off. So, Philippa, I'll give you our second player. We've already mentioned her today, actually. And it is uh, Jazz Matthews, who 
has pretty much played for two clubs. She uh, started at Bristol, came to Liverpool, went back to Bristol, come back to Liverpool. So uh, she's a brilliant centre back. Uh, I must admit, I was really gutted when she left first time because uh, I, I thought the thing that let her down in the first time with us was uh, she just thought she picked up a, a really bad ankle injury. But I think she's been superb for us since she came back. Yeah, absolutely. I think she cemented her place there at the back. Um, you know, it was it was a position for me where I felt we'd probably start the season with Leanne Robe and um, Nifahi. But you can't see how Nifahi can get into the defence now. Uh, for me, I think it's going to be Jazz Matthews and one of the others. Um, I, I really like Michaela Moore as well, but it's a good problem to have, isn't it, that you've got four really good defenders there that you, you're trying to pick two or three out of to, to start a football match. And for me, I, I just can't see who's going to display Shaz at the minute. It's, you know, she she's just been that strong. Um, it's like she's never left, to be honest. It's like she's she's literally, you know, been on a bit of a holiday and she's come back and she's settled right back in again. And it's it's like she's not gone anywhere. It's, it's, it's been great to see. Um, and I, I think that she's someone who, who, you know, when we're talking about this progressive play from the likes of Rachel Laws, I think she's another one. You can see that she's always on the front foot and wanting to move forward on the ball. And I think, you know, that that really helps us because I think sometimes we we could possibly be a little bit too static there at the back. Um, so to have players like Leanne Rowe, Michaela Moore and Jazz Matthews there, you know, to get on the ball, to be so confident on the ball and so comfortable with the ball at the feet to, to be able to pro progress the play forward, I think I think is a really good uh, weapon to have now. Yeah, and Emma, uh, you say now, when you spoke to Mac Beard, uh, as soon as he found out she was available, it was the first play, play he wanted. He felt she was one of the key reasons why uh, Bristol in the end struggled. I think she picked up an injury near the end of the season and he always felt that's what cost cost Bristol a real chance of staying up was she was the linchpin of what they needed yeah and it is interesting what Philippa there was saying in terms of like her ability on the ball because that was another thing that Matt said she said uh, he said not everyone saw it at Bristol because Bristol were often kind of on the back foot especially towards the end of the season obviously they were fighting against relegation and um yeah teams were coming onto them so you kind of saw her defensive side um but one thing he was keen to stress was was that ability that she has in terms of um, playing the high line, controlling the line, um, sort of reading situations off the ball, coming into into the spaces in, in midfield, making those kind of punchy passes to you know bypass um, midfield and, and and use the kind of the wide players that, that we were playing with against Palace. So um, I think we saw we saw glimpses, uh, very good glimpses of what she can do, and actually I don't think. We probably used her enough against Palace. It sounds mad when I'm talking mm. about a centre back, but we've seen it um, to put it into context for you know fans who follow the men's game. We've seen the impact Van Dyke can have on the ball in terms of you know um, starting attacks from that kind of deep central position. I think Jazz has the ability to do that um, with this with this women's team, um, depending on the setup, depending on the opposition, and 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 so forth. But um, yeah, Matt. Matt absolutely was delighted to to bring her in, and said that yeah, she was she was very much his priority person, if not in that priority list of players that he wanted to bring in. So um, yeah, she for me is is probably the one player um, that is absolutely nailed on a starter in that in that defence, whether or not it's a back four or a back three. I'm putting her in straight away. Fair enough, fair enough. And then the final play, I'll come back to you, Neil. The final player. Um, is actually uh, Jazz's partner, uh, who was uh, brilliant at the weekend, uh, Leanne Robe, who, uh, if she starts against Coventry, which we all expected to start against Coventry, will make her 50th appearance for the club. A um, little, surpri little surprise that she hadn't already made 50, but um, I think she's been absolutely brilliant since she's come to the club. Uh, for those who uh, know me and see me going off, my daughter absolutely adores this woman. <laughs> uh, she she is like a little inspiration for football. She's got a thing for centre-back for my daughter. So first it was Gemma Bonner, then it was... Liam Rowe, but I do feel as good as she was, she did great for us uh, playing uh, right back and left back for us. Centre back just looks the best position for her, and th that back three made her look fantastic. I think it did. I think she looks more powerful this season. Uh, to be honest with you, I think she looks like she's got a she's got a certain sort of 
um, I think the middle of the pitch suits to being able to see everything and being able to know when to when to step and when not to. And as I say, I think within that it makes her look look more powerful as she plays and as she goes at times. I think she's she's been excellent uh, so far uh, as a, 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 as of course a sort of game by game. I think she's really impressed and. You, a lot of footballers. I, I think there's, I think, I think there's a bit of a misconception, really, that you know you've got to be absolutely enormous to play centre back. And I don't think she does. I think she's able to do it in a, in a way which, as I say, because she's she's got a good leap on her when she needs it, but it's very much in her, in her anticipation. Uh, and she looks to me like someone who's constantly sort of very. She has the right amount of fear to play central defence in that she's 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 presuming the worst and hoping for the best rather than the other way around. And I think that you've seen that so far in in her performances. I think she looks good. I think Liverpool can can continue to to rely on her and, and, and build around her. And I do sort of feel as though this this could become could become her season. I think there's there's uh, one of the problems with the back three and in general is I think Liverpool have been maybe trying to sort of shoehorn a hair and neve Farhi both into the team at once and there may not be room for the two of them and that'll give the manager a bit of a tough decision to make. Now there's there's games to make changes in and all of that sort of stuff, whether it's a three or it's a four. Um, for me, I feel as though at the minute Liana's got that shirt and whilst Neve might be captain, sometimes that just happens to you when the, you're the captain of the football team. You can't necessarily quite then got a different role to play. You've got to be the player who comes from the bench. You've got to be the player who waits a turn. You've got to be a player who leads by example by not playing and respecting the fact that so, someone else has grabbed an opportunity in your absence and is running with it. And I, I, I feel like that's going to be a little problem for Matt, you know, without sort of talking too much about the personality of either player. I, I think it is difficult to imagine a Liverpool side with them both on the pitch at the minute, which a year and a half ago, it felt very, very different indeed, you know. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and if you were going to pick, you were very much going the other way around. Sometimes this happens. Liverpool squads, you know, we, we talked about it before in quite glowing terms. But one of the things that you would say for the manager is there's a lot of players who look like they're of relatively similar ability. Um, you know, there's a, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of good players, but there isn't a very clear hierarchy as to who the very best ones are in any one of a number of these positions. And that's going to take a little bit of management from the from, from the manager. You know, it, I think it is another reason why it's important Liverpool do find a way to go deep in the cups so that he, he's able to keep everybody involved and everybody feeling as though they're good with it. Because the other thing that we often talk about when we talk about the women's game is the long periods without without matches that can make that a little bit difficult. And at the minute, for, as far as I'm concerned, Leanne Robe is that sort of that senior centre back presence. Um she's the one I will play in the middle of the three. Uh if you're picking a three, uh, if you're picking a two, I think it'll be her and Jazz Matthews. And I think that that therefore then what I think it's important that the manager doesn't try and do is shoehorn his captain in because at the minute it's Leanne Robe's shirt. I totally agree. Totally agree. I mean I think I saw a, a debut which is in a, a nil nil against Everton uh, pre season and it struck you in the first five minutes the one thing she's got is Pure aggression, and I just think sometimes you need, but you need that sense about you know she'll take no messing and she worked really hard. Uh, but that kind of shows what, how she is as a personality for her career. Because I mean, when she was at Millwall, I think Millwall at the time were uh, semi-professional, and I've seen interviews where she talks about she was doing extra training, you know, to get herself up to WSL fitness. And she said, once I was there, you were displacing me, and she's kind of just grown. And I just think she's. Uh, ideal for Liverpool and Liverpool's ideal for her. I think it's like a, a perfect match. I don't know if you feel the same, Emma. Yeah, um, I think she's shown that commitment and I, I'm pretty sure her contract runs out in the summer, so it'll be interesting to see don't whether she um, yeah. is in talks in sort of January with other clubs because she hasn't um, yet really had a nailed-on starting 11 position, um, as Neil sort of touched on. So if she can kind of over the next month or so really kind of cement her place... Um, then I think that that would be good news for us and, and maybe for Matt in terms of, you know, those contract negotiations, because I'd be interested to see what, yeah, what, what she would do with, with that kind of in mind. Um, but yeah, she's, she's definitely grown during the time that, that I've seen her at Liverpool. Um, and she's, as I say, she's kind of always faced competition for a place and yet she's always stepped up to whatever level that might be, um, whether or not she was asked to play at right back or left back or centre back, she kind of, always fought her way into the team in that role and then kind of impressed in that role. Someone else came in who she had to then compete with and then she's sort of gone up another level and and has kind of forced her way back in again. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. And just on Nifahi as well, interestingly, I think, you know, we've seen her kind of 
been used in that defensive midfield role as well. Mm -hmm. So that might be an option that Matt is looking at is um, to avoid that kind of shoehorning as if, if she is an option in that kind of DM role. Um, but also we've seen we've seen Rachel Furness struggle to get into the side. So maybe, you know, maybe it's those kind of personalities that, that are just going to have to take take a bit of a hit and, um, you know, maybe they are going to be the players that are going to come on and use their experience and use their maturity from the bench to just help see out games. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting one. Yeah, I mean, Philippa, going forward, you know, looking at the next month now, we've got uh, four games the next month. We've got... Uh, the big two away games uh, away at Coventry and then the big one, which would be away at Sheffield United, currently top of the league. Uh, a few ex-Liverpool players there, an ex-Liverpool manager there. So it's going to be uh, an entertaining Saturday game there. Uh, and then the return of the Conti Cup. So for people who don't know what the Conti Cup is, it is the women's version of the League Cup. Difference is it's a league structure. So you have a teams of four. Everyone, play, everyone plays one game. You play three games in it uh, and top two go through. But... The fun part is if the game is a draw, straight to penalty shootout, you win the pens, you get an, you get a bonus point as well. So it does make the games quite entertaining. Uh, Liverpool have got a tough one, though, at home to WSL side Villa uh, on the 13th of October. And there's a bit of a gap. And then we got Lou, is it Lose? I, was, I, was, was it I think it's Lose. Lose. Uh-huh. I, was, I pronounce it wrong every time. Uh, we've got them on uh, Halloween, 31st of October. So an interesting. Uh, run. I wouldn't say it's particularly easy run. I'd say it's quite a challenge for them, but hopefully, having got the game, win at Palace and the, the win away, away at Watford, you know, you like to think that's something we can build on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the thing we've got to do is we've got to take the positives out of the, the Palace game uh, and move forward with them. You know, I, I kind of feel like this side is one that, that needs confidence. Um, so they need a run of two, three, four wins on the bounce and then. I really do get the impression that they could be flying, um, but they need to get those. And, you know, to have two away games now on the back of the Palace game is is kind of the one where you like, ideally we'd like to be at home. And I think the, the Coventry game, I, I believe, is on a 3G pitch as well. So, you know, it adds in that little bit of a an unknown as well. And it's something that we really struggled with last season, those 3G pitches. So... You know, I hope it's something that the club have worked on. It's something that Matt's aware of that, you know, we need to to bear in mind as well and, you know, maybe adjust things slightly for that. Um, but, you know, if we're being honest here, if we look at our squad and we look at our starting eleven comparing to either of, um, you know, Coventry United or, or Sheffield United, you know, you would pick Liverpool's to be starting the game and to, and to be winning those games and, you know, I know Sheffield United are at the top of the league at the moment, but if we're serious about getting promoted, you know, we should be going there and 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 winning those games. You know, the game's being played at Bramall Lane as well, so it's 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 a good pitch to be playing on. It's one where the fans can go. I think it's a pound as well for the tickets, which you know, yeah. it's international break as well. So get as many fans down there as possible and, and try and turn it into a bit of a home game as well. Um, you know, I'm really excited about that one. Um, and then the Conti Cup, I know it's one that Matt's hinted that he's going to make wholesale changes for because his, his priority is getting us promoted this season and that's perfectly understandable. Um, but when you look at the squad and we've named a lot of players there that aren't getting games at the moment, you know, those yeah. um, teams that you can put out as well should be good enough to be able to be competitive. Mm-hmm. On the, on the Conti Cup game, the thing I will point out is that the one against Villa, which will be 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night, and if people can get down to Prenton Park, they should do. Villa so currently sit third in the WSL. They've got themselves a good win over Leicester, which is a bit of a marker for us off the back of last season as to, as, as to the fact that Villa are a good side. But Liverpool, they play Villa. They don't play again for for three weeks. <laughs> you know, the, the, what are you resting them for if you're resting them yeah. in that sort of scenario? Now, that's not to say you can't make changes. And, and as I've said, I think there's a lot of players in that in that squad who I think are, you know, comparable to the, the, the ones who are currently starting. And, you know, it, it could be an opportunity for a few to stake a bit of a claim. But for me, you know, I, I want to see Liverpool firstly take take the competition itself relatively seriously but also in amongst there take that game seriously it's an opportunity for people to get down to Prenton Park it's a different atmosphere it becoming a night game you know it turns it into something a little bit different and if Liverpool can sort of put the backs into that one it'd be lovely to see the sort of numbers because the one thing we haven't talked about the weekend it was a really good attendance and keeping the, the pattern of that you know that is now 
you know, as it stands, that game is Liverpool's next home. Uh, they play that one on the 13th of October, and then there isn't any other game full stop until the 31st of October, like you say, Chris, about it being Halloween. You know, Liverpool have got to, you know, it's important that we, we, we get to showcase a team for everyone to see and to also stake a bit of a claim that there doesn't have to be a big gap between Liverpool and the WSL. You know, the, we, we, we want to feel like Liverpool can hit the ground running going into next season if they get up. And I think that part of that, you know, Villa are the only WSL team in this group. So I think Liverpool need to, you know, in a general confidence boosty way, I'd like to see Liverpool put a real performance in. And even if they don't win the game, lay a bit of a marker down. But there's no reason why they couldn't win the game. Last season, they beat Manchester United mm. in this competition. And it was, it was arguably the best moment of the season when yeah. they beat Manchester United. So I think that Liverpool have got to, they've got to find a way to commit to that game. And as I say, there can be changes, but it's an important game. And it's an important game for the story we want to tell one another about the whole of this season. Very true, very true. Um, because I'm such a bad host, I also forgot. I actually forgot the, the the biggest thing which happened, which was uh, Ash Ash Hudson became Liverpool women's all time leading appearance holder. You know, it's kind of a big thing. I probably should have mentioned that quite early on, really. So, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Ash broke the record. Uh, she's now got 100, she 117, 117 appearances now. The record beating the record of Gemma Bonner, one one five. So, I mean, and to be fair, Ash, Ash's only in the mid twenties. You know, she she's got a long career ahead. That could be a very big record to break. But you know. Uh, for those who are Ash obviously broke in uh, to the Liverpool ranks as a youngster, uh, does have a WSL women's title to her name, and he's becoming a, a key part. And we saw that at the, at the weekend. She she was brilliant at the weekend. Yeah, she yeah she was she was excellent at the weekend. I thought she deserved her goal, capped off a good a good two weeks for her. Um, but yeah, no, she's she's been she's been an ever present kind of within the squad. She's always been that that player that. Um, you don't necessarily talk about first um, and you don't really ever forget as well, um, which I know doesn't sound like a compliment, but I am, I am being complimentary there by saying she's, you know, she's just, you just kind of assume that she's going to be staying and carrying on and playing, playing a role because she just goes about a business. Um, she's always progressing. She's always improving. She's never, never wanted to be the star of the show. She's happy whether or not she's, I mean, obviously all the foot, footballers want to be playing, and starting but she you know she's just as happy coming off from the bench and she still puts in the same performances I think when she comes on as a substitute or when she's in the starting 11 I think she gives you the the same thing so you know what you're going to get with Ash you get that consistency and um she's had a couple of serious injuries as well so to mm. actually reach that achievement at such a young age is is just a credit to herself and, and her family and I'm sure she'll go on and and um, yeah, make make a couple more appearances for Liverpool. That's for sure. She always just feels like a positive selection. Where if she starts, you know, you don't want her to go off, and if she comes off the bench, you always feel like something's going to happen. She kind of has that aura around her that yeah. I always feel something positive will will happen around her. So you know, that, that's probably what she has. And it's amazing someone who's had, I think, it's two ACL injuries doesn't seem to have yeah. lost any pace, which is mm -hmm. testament to the medical side, a testament to her, because you know it's hard to come back from one ACL. I can imagine to come back from two there's some mental strength there which you know not everyone has that so you know it's a great it's a great thing you know stupidly they mentioned it at the top of the show probably was the biggest <laughs> thing to mention but you know i'll get i'll get better at this hosting malarkey uh so uh before we go uh just a few bits of admin uh sienna steps um we've had a bit of a breakthrough in sienna steps so uh, they had a fundraiser she's now up to the 100k mark so only we're only 20k short now of her getting a full target for her to get um, over to America. So she's got enough for the treatment. The remaining 20K is more for the family to have to live in America for a, about a month after the tr after her treatment so she can have an important physio. So it's on our Twitter page. Um, if you if you can't find it on our Twitter page, just type in Sienna Steps in Google. It's the first thing that comes on Google. Just click on the GoFundMe, give what you can. If you can't give anything, just reshare it. It's more than appreciated. But... Um, as always, for the women's show, you know, please like it, please share it. You know, um, it's a new show for the trippers. We're trying our we're trying our best to get more and more views in it. We want to get more and more people watching the women talk about the women's games. You know, I've I've been talking about it on trippers now for the last two years. I've been on it, so you know, it, it's really good. It's really good, and I don't, you know, I don't. I think you should just, as the, Neil said, join the journey. So, uh, Philippa, Neil, Emma, thank you very much for joining us, and hopefully, uh, when we come back in a month's time, we'll be talking about the top of the league. Until then, guys, take care of yourselves and we'll speak to you soon.